I'll, I'll, I'll give you some quotes of what you've kind of said and things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, then- That should be interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Cloud Therapist channel. I'm Richard Simon and today I have Nigel Poulton with me. Nigel is the man who wrote the book on Kubernetes, literally. Hello Nigel, how are you doing? Hey Richard, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm all right, thank you. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So um, Nigel, I have, uh, obviously we're going to be covering your, your book for, uh, for today and a little bit about what you, what you do and your contribution into the sort of the, the Kubernetes world and the cloud native world. Uh, but yeah, just give us a quick uh, sort of profile summary of yourself, please. Um, so I think I'm a techaholic at heart. So I'm one of these people that loves technology for the sake of technology. And I kind of have a hard time um, trying to translate, well, actually, there's business requirements and customers and things like that. And you can't just deploy and play with whatever technology you want. It's got to have a purpose for the business or for the organization that you work for. And um, so I'm one of those people that kind of struggles with that. Like I would, if I could choose any career in the world, I'd be a footballer, like a soccer player, really? um, which, which, yeah, which is never going to happen. OK, um, but if I had a second choice and this will sound pretty sad and geeky, but I would absolutely do exactly what I'm doing today. So working with very cool technologies that just make me excited to get out of bed on them <laughs> is so sad but really make me get excited to get out of bed and um, get work and writing the books, making the videos, whatever it is. Um, I feel super privileged like that. So I'm one of those people that, um, you know, that corny saying that um, if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. Mm. And I haven't worked a day for a very long time now. Indeed. Yeah. I, I get, I mean, when I get asked, sometimes I say I get paid for doing my hobby, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, that's a really, absolutely. yeah, very, very much a, a great position to be in. So just very briefly, how did you, um, not kind of digging too much into the background, but how did you actually sort of get into Kubernetes? What sort of got you on sort of the Kubernetes uh, train, so to speak? Yeah. So I think because I love technology and I'm passionate about it and I want to play with things that are new, um, certainly when containers came along and Docker was very new, um, I was working as um, a storage specialist and I was finishing up writing a book about data storage networking. Um, and I was at an, an event, HP Discover as it was called before it was HPE. Um, and the same week that that was on was the very first DockerCon and I was tracking it on the socials and things. And I'd been, I'd had half an eye on Docker. Um, <clears throat> well, actually I'd had more than half an eye on it. Um, I'd been playing around with it, but I was sat at HP Discover wishing yeah. that I was at DockerCon. Um, and that was kind of an aha moment for me. It was like, well, why don't you just totally switch what you're doing as much as possible and get into the container world? And once you were into there, um, it was maybe a year or two later that Kubernetes first hit. Right. And just because I'm one of those people that likes to learn new stuff and challenge myself, um, then obviously Kubernetes was one of those natural technologies to get into, considering I was already sort of into containers. In fact, I'll say this, right? So um, when it comes to technology, um, I like, so I dreamt of working the kind of jobs I do now when I was a kid. In fact, I dreamt about being on, a, on the Starship Enterprise, right? Um, <laughs> Geordie LaForge or Mr. Scott or whatever, you know. Um, I was gonna Scott ask you, which one, which one would you go for? <laughs> Um, I'd have gone for um, the Enterprise D, um, okay, Jordi yeah. LaForge, that would have been me. Yeah, yeah good choice. Um, but those days for me, right, technology was almost magical and it, there was a mystery and there was mm. um, the, the aspect of learning it and figuring it out was what motivated me. So I'm constantly on this trend where once I kind of figure out a technology and learn it, yeah. I'm kind of like, okay, I'm sort of done with that one now and I want to move on to the next thing. So I immediately wanted to be on with Kubernetes, the mystery of it, the challenge of it. But the thing with Kubernetes is that it's growing and it's iterating and developing at warp speed, if you don't mind the, uh, the pun. So no, that's fine. Very effect. good. <laughs> yeah, well, it just keeps me locked in. Do you know what I mean? There's new yeah. stuff coming all the time, new challenges. Mm. We're throwing in service meshes and things like that today. And yeah. that just keeps my mind like, 
How do I figure this out? What can we use it for? What is it good at? What is it not good at? And that's mm. keeping me going. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I certainly relate to that as well. I kind of have made a sort of pivotal change in, in my career as well. So, um, yeah. So uh, one of the things I, I did notice in one of your videos, and this is kind of slightly anecdotal, is that you had a, there was a t shirt that said OCD, obsessed car driver or something. And I picked that up on a, one of your videos. Yeah, obsessive car disorder, I think. So um, I, I do have a family, um, so I spend a lot of time with the family. Right. Um, but my passion or my second passion outside of technology and outside of football um, is cars. Um, wow. So I'm, I'm kind of into cars. But that's really challenging with my kids at the moment because they're, I think they're 9, 11 and 14. I should mm -hmm. know that better, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> yeah. But they're of that age and they go to school in the UK where yeah. they're constantly being taught about the environment and things. Mm. So being passionate about cars kind of has challenges for my kids because they're like, Dad, you shouldn't really have cars with big engines or anything like yeah. that. And, and they're absolutely right. Um, so that's kind of challenging for me as well. Fantastic. And obviously, um, you know, the uh, I kind of introduced you, you know, about, uh, in regards to your book, and certainly your book is, is kind of what we're going to be covering uh, uh, a great deal today. Uh, but you also have sort of, um, you know, your, your training courses as well that, that you deliver. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I try to cover the whole um, gambit if I can. Like some people prefer reading. Um, some people prefer learning by watching. Some people prefer learning by doing. So I kind of have my hand in all three of those, if possible, just so that, and you know what as well, like quite often people that would take my video courses or my books or whatever would reach out to me afterwards. And I love it when people do, by the way. And they say, hey, look, I love whatever I did, whatever you created, um, it was great, but what do I do now? And if they've read the book, I can all say, well, I've got a, se a series of video courses and we've got some hands-on stuff that you can do. Mm. Um, so it's just, you know, it, instead of sort of boxing myself into one area, I write yeah. books or whatever, I try and, and vary it for the people that consume my material, but also for me as well. Because like yeah. when I'm finished doing a video course, they take a long time to do and they're hard work and I'm super proud of them when they're done. Yeah. But I don't want to immediately start another one. It's a good opportunity to say, let's refresh the book or let's add a chapter to a book or or sure. something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And you, you like, I mean, you, you cover on YouTube as well. You have a channel there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, on the YouTube channel, we try and just take something Kubernetes or container related um, have it short and sharp, but really boil it down um, and make it a bit fun. So we did one, one of my favorites. I brought my 14 year old daughter in on it. And um, when Kubernetes, um, when it first released endpoint slices, I think as an alpha sort of feature, it's not really a mm -hmm. feature, um, to replace endpoint objects. Yeah. And we used, uh, we got out some sliced cheese versus a block of big cheese and we used that to demonstrate why endpoint slices are preferable yes. over endpoint objects. And, you know, we use this kind of cheesy cheese analogy, um, but all just to have a bit of fun, but keep it technical and help people to learn. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's, I think that's great. I think that's, kind of, you know, uh, certainly very, uh, very useful. Uh, and and I've, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of, a lot of the videos on the channel and they absolutely make perfect like that, perfect sense like that. Uh, so um, just kind of um, just getting slightly more in, into Kubernetes. So um, you've you've kind of described uh, Kubernetes as a, um, or, or I, I look at it as a sort of a complete replacement really for the operating system and the hypervisor. Is that something that you kind of agree with? I, I think you've mentioned that before. Um, so I think the, the concept of Kubernetes, and we do hear people say this, right? And it's jargon or buzzwords. And mm. unfortunately, unfortunately, the industry loves a buzzword, right? Yeah, um, but we quite often refer, yeah, well, we quite often refer to Kubernetes as the um, operating system of the cloud. Right. Now, ju just to sort of frame that, um, if you think about a traditional server, and then you put an operating system on top of that so that you can run an application, right? At the end of the day, the application or the developer or the customer that's consuming the application, they don't really care about the server at the bottom. Now, I really used to care about those servers, right? Back in the early Me days too, of my yeah. career. Yeah, well, I was quite passionate about compact servers that became HP servers, the ProLiant mm -hmm. series. Um, and I cared passionately 
that it wasn't a Dell server or a Supermicro or a Cisco server or something like that, don't get me wrong. They're all great servers. Um, but I cared about that, but nobody else did, right? And, yeah. and they didn't have to because the operating system came along. So you would take whoever's server hardware and you'd um, lash Linux or Windows on top of it. And that abstracted it so that you mm. could run your application on, let's just call it Windows, okay? Yeah. And nobody cared if it was a Dell or a Cisco or if it was a DL380 or a, an ML58. Mm. You know, I forget the model numbers these yeah. days. Yeah. Nobody cared about what the low-level infrastructure was. The operating system abstracted it. And in a very similar way these days, Kubernetes does that for the cloud or on-premises infrastructure. So as right. long as your application will run on Kubernetes, you can have Kubernetes running on virtual machines on your on-premises data center or instances in AWS or a hosted Kubernetes service in Azure or Google Cloud or wherever. And your application doesn't care yeah. and the consumers or the users of your application don't care because Kubernetes just abstracts it all. So in that respect, um, yes, very much so Kubernetes is the operating system of the cloud by just sort of abstracting away the stuff that I still think is cool. And it's very important that low level hardware, of course, yeah. um, just the end consumer of the application shouldn't really have to know or care whether you're on AWS or wherever, yeah? Yeah, so I mean, the, the emphasis has really kind of moved up the software stack, so to speak. So you're kind of so removed really from, from that sort of low level stuff these days. It's, um, it's, it's not kind of as, as relevant as, as it used to be. Absolutely. I think like commoditization of that software stack, um, all, I think I'm, I'm right in saying this is the way it feels to me at least, is it starts with the lower levels and then you start commoditizing higher and higher up. And I, look, I, I fully expect, I don't think it will be next year, um, but not in the too distant future, we'll be running our applications and it'll be like, oh, and by the way, it's Kubernetes underneath. Mm. You know, we won't even have to be focusing on Kubernetes at some point. We yeah. kind of do at the moment. Um, but I think the trend is that at some point it'll be just like Kubernetes is ubiquitous and it's everywhere, just yeah. like Linux is or Windows. And it's kind of like it's, it's there, but we don't really have to care about it. It's given us loads of good stuff, but we just care about the application. Yeah, I mean, certainly, the, the I think the industry is it is is obsessed with sort of um, you know Kubernetes at the moment. We've seen a lot of you know vendors sort of products integrated into their you know existing platforms. We had lots of you know new startups that are focusing purely on on that. I was I was involved with one a couple of years ago myself. Uh, so so why do you think kind of you know the uh, um, why do you think Kubernetes has been such a phenomenal success? Um, well, I think the market was ripe for it in a lot of respect. So obviously, um, when containers became popular, thanks to Docker, now, of course, containers were around before, and there were different yeah. types of containers, but modern containers, as we know them, it, it's very much thanks to the folks that were at Docker. Um, once we started leveraging containers, because of the sort of the patterns that they enforced on us, like microservices and things like that, we naturally needed something to manage our container sprawl yeah. or our application sprawl. Um, and various op um, options came along, Docker Swarm, Apache Mesos, um, Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, and obviously Kubernetes is the one that has, look, let's just say it has the brightest future. It's got the most momentum. It's got the most industry backing. But do you know what I think was a big thing behind it is that um, I think Amazon in Amazon Web Services really blindsided the industry. Your Microsofts, your IBMs, your HPEs, all of those people that were comfortable enterprise partners in selling yeah. hardware and just ticking over were really blindsided when AWS came along and ate their lunch effectively. Nobody liked yeah. somebody else eating their lunch. Yeah. So what happened then was, I guess initially the rest of the market started saying, well, we'll build a cloud that's better than AWS or that can compete with AWS. But you know what? Once somebody's got a lead in a market, it's really hard to rein them in no matter who you are. And that really wasn't working. I mean, we had the whole OpenStack thing going on for a while. Yes. I think a lot of people wanted OpenStack to be um, an alternative to AWS, something that would compete feature to feature. Yes. Um, and that never really happened. Mm. So what was needed was something that would come along and almost abstract AWS that you could layer on top of it and say, write your applications to this platform, Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will hide whatever's below. Now I'm oversimplifying, okay, because Kubernetes doesn't hide everything. 
below. Yeah, um, in the same way that, you know, you could have two physical servers and if one of them's got loads of memory and a bunch of NVMe storage in there and another one doesn't, it's not a great deal that Linux or Windows can do about, you know, masking or hiding those features. Um, but the core bits, Kubernetes comes along and does really abstract away or commoditizes, there's, there's, that's a good idea actually, commoditizes that AWS infrastructure and says, look, just put Kubernetes on anybody's cloud and move your application, you can migrate off AWS, onto AWS, whatever you want. So I think that like your Microsofts and your HPEs and your Cisco's and everybody like that, IBM's all needed something to compete with AWS. This is my opinion, okay? Sure. Um, and Kubernetes um, just so happened almost by accident to come along and sort of fill that role, make it easy to get your apps off of AWS and onto somebody else's cloud. Um, I think we all intended that it would be open stack, but that never happened. And as so often happens from the left field, in came Kubernetes. Uh, and I think that's a big push for it. I feel like all the major vendors need Kubernetes there mm. um, to rein in AWS and level the playing field. So Nigel, um, tell me a little bit as to, you know, what, what made you actually uh, write a book on Kubernetes? Why did you decide to do that? Uh, I wanted to become wealthy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there is no money to be made. It really right wasted it bad. <laughs> uh, no, do you know what? So um, books in general, uh, technology books have been massively influential in my career. Um, and I, I remember one particular book, I still have a copy, unfortunately, I don't have it here with me now. But Mark Manassi's Mastering Windows Server 2000, I think it was about a 1200 page hardback copy that I had, was massively influential in my early career when I was switching from being a netware admin into Windows NT and Windows 2000. It was hugely influ influential for me. In fact, um, like I said earlier in, in the show, you know, I'm quite passionate about technology. Mm. So when I when I got married and Jen and I went away for our honeymoon in, um, oh gosh, I, I forget the name of the place. Don't tell me you were writing, writing chapters from the book on your honeymoon. No, no, but on my honeymoon on a Greek island, I would take Mark Manassi's book. She doesn't book. watch these videos, does she? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'll take Mark's book to the pool, I took it on hikes, I took it to the beach, and um, everywhere we went, I mm. took that book in a backpack with me. Wow. Um, that's how important that it was for me. And I really felt like it did help me master Windows Server 2000. Mm. And I think that after I'd read that book, I always wanted to be able to contribute back to the community one day, to be able to have that kind of influence that Mark had had on me, and I'm fortunate enough to have met Mark a couple of times and thanked him personally for it. But because it enabled my career so much, I just thought how cool it would be if I could do that for somebody else. Now, I'll say as well, look, I, I read a lot of other books as I was learning mm. and some were great and some were not great. And money was tight early in my career. We were newly married and all that kind of stuff and um, getting our first home and things. And I was always massively disappointed if I bought a book because I wanted to learn a particular thing and I would read it and I still hadn't learned it. It would really, believe me, it annoyed me no end. So I always wanted to write a book, but I always wanted to make sure that it would be the best. I was gonna say an amazing book and people might disagree, but I would make it as good as I possibly could. I would never mm. put my name against anything, but in this case, a book that I wasn't 100% happy yeah. was a great book. So I think thanks to Mark Minassi and Windows Server 2000 kind of put something in the back of my mind. It was like, one day I want to contribute back. Sure. And uh, you've had a couple of the chapters in this book, which we'll cover um, a little bit as well, uh, uh, by a chap called uh, Pushkar Joglikar as well. He's kind of helped yeah. you with some of the writing. Yeah. So there's a story behind that. Um, I'd written a book on my own a few years ago now. And the book is interesting. Well, we're talking about the Kubernetes book here. Mm. Um, although I, I wrote it, I think, initially in 2017, it's always been updated fully twice a year at least every year since I've written it. Um, so the book kind of evolves. Now, Pushkar, he bought my book and read it, and he sought me out at a DockerCon event. I can't remember mm -hmm. where it was now, in the States somewhere. Um, he would reached out to me on Twitter, um, and I'd connected with him when we'd been talking. He said, oh, can I meet you at DockerCon? I'm like, yeah, of course. 
-hmm. So we, we uh, met up in the corridor one day and he's like, look, I'm a security guy working in Kubernetes and I would love to contribute a couple of chapters to your book. Now, he wasn't the first person to ask me this, but he was the first person to ask me face to face. Right. I had a lot of people would email me and stuff and, mm -hmm. and I'd always pushed it off because um, I don't know, on something like this, this will sound cheesy, but um, I feel like my videos and my books don't take this the wrong way, right? But in some way are a work of art. Like I have made something, I've created something. It's, it's, yeah. There's a piece of me in that book. Yeah. It has a particular style. It has a particular way that it reads and a format yeah. and what have you. The whole approach is like, is, is me written down. So I've always pushed people back, but Pushkar is a really nice guy. Um, as much as I love technology, I'll be honest, I'm not massively interested in security. It kind of mm. bores me. And um, so I thought, do you know what? Security is important. And I, I could do with some security chapters in there. Yeah. I don't fancy learning the stuff to be able to write them. Mm. Why don't I work with Pushkar? He was keen, said, OK, let's do that. So, um, look, it's worked. And I'm, I'm grateful to Pushkar. And, you know, he continues to update the chapters every time we update the book and stuff. And it's been a great addition to the book. But taking the the raw manuscript of the chapters he created for me mm. and me trying to then format them to my style of the book, because yeah. he had his own way of writing and stuff, was really, really hard work. Um, yeah. So um, I'm grateful to Pushkar and I'm happy for him to contribute going forward. He's a great guy. I love him. Um, but I, I would be very cautious before partnering with somebody else in the future because mm. It's actually, it's a lot more hard work than I thought it would be taking somebody else's work yeah. and making it fit. Do you know what I mean? Without it being jarring, like, oh, it's yeah, obvious I, that somebody else. Yeah, and no, I can appreciate that. And, and I can appreciate you kind of, you know, as you said earlier, you're sort of passionate about what you do. So everything's kind of yeah. your baby and you and you want to kind of articulate what, you know, what's in your sort of mind about things. So I can, I yeah. can certainly, you know, uh, uh, I agree with that and, and I relate to that. So, so what were kind of your aims for, for the book? Just briefly, kind of, just tell me kind of who, who you sort of targeted with, with the book. Yeah, so I come from more of an infrastructure background than a developer background. I mean, my first job, I was a coder, writing applications and stuff. So I've done both, but I've spent most of my time before getting into containers and Kubernetes, excuse me, as more of an infrastructure guy. Mm. And I struggled with a lot of the conceptual changes when switching to containers cloud native, microservices, APIs, um, infrastructure as code, um, you know, desired state reconciliation loops, all, all of that kind of stuff was like, it was so hard for me just to grasp and understand what all this was. Mm. A lot of the things that I read and watched kind of assumed that I, I knew what, you know, a declarative state or a declarative manifest was, yeah. and I didn't. Yeah. So I was like, I think there's a hole here where I can write something and take my ability, and this is not hubris, I've just, people have just told me this quite a bit. Um, and it, it comes from me buying these books in the past that didn't do yes. a good job of explaining things. And I'm super passionate about explaining things. Yeah. So I thought I can write something here and explain these things that I've learned the hard way so that other people can pick them up and grasp them uh, quicker and easier than I did. So I wanted to do that and I thought, well, I can do that in the videos and writing the book. Mm. But the other thing about the book is I said, because I had written a book on data storage networking in the past where I was contracted by a publisher to write it. Right. And that was a very painful process for me. Um, I wrote the book, but it wasn't my book, if you know what I mean. They then had right, control yeah. over it and all that. Sure. So I, I decided I would self-publish this time so that I could... Put, I mean, the Kubernetes book, I, I know one of the years I did four updates to it that year because so much changed in Kubernetes. Right, yeah. um, so I wanted something that I was in full control of that was mine, that I could update whenever was right for the reader and mm. wasn't right for the publishing company. Um, so I wanted to bring something that was a little bit different. Yes, I wanted to explain things super clearly, but I wanted the book to be always fresh. Like, so anybody that buys the Lean Pub or the Kindle electronic versions is entitled to every free update that I do. Yeah. And um, there's not much I can do about the paperback versions from Amazon, because once you've bought that, like, I, I, I don't even get free paperback versions from Amazon. It's a, you know, print on demand service. They charge yeah. me for every proof copy that I want, you know. Sure, yeah. um, 
So if you bought an older paperback version, I can't do much about that. But what I can say is if you buy the paperback today, it will never be more than 12 months old. In fact, usually it's like at the most six months old. So you know you're getting something that, that's bang up to date and the examples in it will work with the latest versions of Kubernetes and stuff. So that was my goal, explain things clearly and, and have it always up to date. Okay, and how did you sort of go about putting all the elements together for the book? Um, so I think what happened was, I'd, if I remember right, I'd already written or I'd already developed a video course on getting started with Kubernetes, oh, okay. right. which meant I'd put in a lot of the hard work and, and learned a lot of the lessons about like, what is the flow like to take somebody from not knowing anything or knowing very little and step them through things in the right order? And I've got a ton of feedback from my video courses and things. And I thought, you know what? There's a lot of legwork done here. Now, books are very different to video courses, of course. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I had the model or the plan for something that worked. Um, so I just set about writing the book. And I wanted to do it as my book, like I say, self-published. I had already self-published a book called Docker Deep Dive. So I knew how to write the book in Markdown and publish it on LeanPub as a PDF or whatever, mm -hmm. but then go through the process of converting that into a Kindle book and then to a paperback on Amazon. So I kind of, I'd already learned that sort of, look, I'm a techie at the end of the day, I'm not a book publisher. Yeah. Um, and I, I get super bored of like working out how to convert it into a paperback, but it already worked out how to do that with the Docker book. So I thought, look, yes. let's do this with Kubernetes as well. Sure. And I'll be honest, look, it's hard work at times and there really isn't money in writing books. Um, but it, it's it's super satisfying to, to have like, you know, I've, I've got a copy here, like, you know, a, a printed paperback copy of the book. Absolutely. I'm like, to be able for me to hold this. Um, and I, I have fun writing it as well. Don't get me wrong. In fact, look, let me show you this, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about um, Star Trek before. Ah, uh, yes. Um, th this here. Ah, yes. So, <laughs> This the is version. the Klingon edition. Of no, no, the I can read Klingon. It's kind of vague. No, well, so the thing is, so it's it's the front cover is written in Klingon, and, and all of this YAML here is in Klingon as well. And then the um, I think the, there's a, a Klingon specific intro, but then the rest of it is written in English, of course. Okay, right. More of it. It's more of a tribute edition. If you're into Star Trek, yeah, and you're into Kubernetes, just on Amazon, Kubernetes Klingon you'll find that the latest edition has a red cover, which is a bit more Klingon-y. Right. Um, but that's the kind of fun that I have when I'm writing it. It's cool. like, let's make this fun and let, let's do some cool stuff with these things. Absolutely. No, I think that's, I think that's, um, that's definitely quite cool. But I mean, we're not sort of expecting Hollywood to, you know, to come calling anytime soon, though, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> the Kubernetes book. So. No. Okay. So um, what, what's been the reception like uh, on the book? What kind of feedback have you had? Yeah, so I think I so I don't particularly look at the reviews now because last time I checked on Amazon, it's got over four hundred reviews. I think it's mm -hmm. about four and a half stars. Well, no, no, never mind the never mind the main reviews. What about sort of people coming up to you and you know conferences and stuff like that? What's kind of you know? This let's is, let's this, talk about the grassroots guys. That's not. I, I will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this will sound super cheesy, and maybe it's just because these are the only people that come and approach me at conferences. But people love it because I'm passionate about it. Yeah. Um, it, that kind of comes through in the book um, and people are always thanking me for it and the style that it's written in. Um, because I don't want this to be like a, hey, Nigel's book's amazing podcast. Mm. I will just say some of the feedback that I had originally when I was monitoring the Amazon reviews, the only negative reviews I ever got for the book was that, well, it doesn't cover this and it doesn't cover that. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Kubernetes is massive. And look, any book on Amazon, you, you can peruse or you can browse the contents page. Mm. Like, I, I, and I never understood why somebody would be able to do that and buy the book and say, well, it doesn't cover this and I'm really yeah. sad. And I'm like, well, you could have looked at the contents yeah, page yeah. and it's looked at what's it. listed yeah. in it and said, this is not the book for me. Yeah. Um, so the only negative feedback genuinely I ever got was that, it doesn't cover everything in Kubernetes. And you know what? If it did, like, I'd never be able to publish it because it'd be this thick. Um, yeah. It'd always be out of date. And it's like worth of, yeah, content. Yeah. So I did have to kind of pick and choose what I put in there. But I, I, 
I picked and, cho and chose um, things that were, generally speaking, were GA, um, mm. so that they were usable in production, and the things that were the core, like to get you that um, sort of bootstrap you to Kubernetes, yes. like from the fundamentals to a point where you can crack on and, you know, you know the fundamentals, you can crack on yourself, really. Yeah, and, and anything that you're kind of, you know, doing, as you said, maybe in a, you know, you're looking to do this in production, the, the book is useful for, for that sort of person. For sure, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And, uh, okay, so so I, I was, um, and I'm, I'm not into sort of memes and stuff like that, but I, somebody sent me something recently, which was quite, quite funny, slightly, um, uh, slightly on a sort of more on, on the anecdotal side. Uh, it was, I think it was a, um, a tweet or something, and it was, quite, it involved Kylie Jenner. And, and Kylie Jenner was asking um, for books to be recommended to her that, you know, that, that made people cry. Um, and somebody responded that said, uh, try reading data structures in Java. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just nice going to me. ask you anything anecdotal about your book. Anybody's kind of given you anything sort of interesting and funny? Um, oh, you put me on the spot now. Um, I mean, a lot of people that have bought the Klingon edition are like, is this real before they bought it, like on Twitter and stuff? And I'm like, yeah. And then we get into exchanging a few Klingon, you know, kapla or whatever, kapla, you know, yeah. um, stuff like that. Um, I've had a few people talk to me about, well, actually, so people will say to me, especially if they've watched my videos before, they're like, I can hear your voice in my head when I'm reading your book Brilliant. because I tend not to write in a very formal style. Yeah. I try and make it as laid back as possible. Um, in my videos, I try and make it like we're sat at a bar chatting about something. Yes. And I think that sort of as comes As you do with like, Kubernetes. Yes. Sit in a pub and talk about it. <laughs> of course, yeah. And that kind of comes across as much as possible in the book. So I do have people saying, Hey, I've got your, you know, your annoying British accent stuck in my head while I'm reading your book here. Um, and I do get that a fair bit. Thank you for watching this talk. If you enjoyed the content, please comment, share, like, and subscribe. See you next time.